Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my dermatopathology fellow, Dr. Ed Fulton, and Ed has selected some nice examples of schwannoma for us to review today. Schwannomas are a benign nerve sheath tumor, uh, also known by the name neurilemoma. Schwannoma and neurilemoma are the same thing. Um, and this picture right here is the classic example that you might see on an exam or or in a, in a medical school lecture of the beautiful, amazing varicae bodies, which are, are quite, quite uh, beautiful to look at, I think. And when you see a schwannoma like this, it's, it's easy, right? Or most of the time, you might think it's easy. And what are varicae bodies? Let's talk about that before we do anything else, because it's the first thing people always want to know about with, with uh, schwannoma. So varicae bodies are this um, unique arrangement of Schwann cells, and a schwannoma is, made, is a tumor made up essentially entirely of Schwann cells. Unlike neurofibromas, which have a mixture of cells, Schwann cells, fibroblasts, perineurial cells, schwannomas in general are just Schwann cells with some rare exceptions. All right, so, um, and if you haven't seen my video about neurofibromas, uh, you might want to check that out because we're going to do some comparing uh, of the features here, the contrasting of the features between schwannoma and neurofibroma in this video. So what you see is the Schwann cells are all lined up in this row, and then you have a space of a fine pink collagen with very few cells, and then another row. And so that these two um, kind of palisaded uh, rows of Schwann cells with intervening fine collagen, kind of an area of cellular rarefaction where there are very few cells in between the rows, that's a called a varicae body, okay? And basically it's just a fancy term for kind of parallel palisades with intervening areas of no or minimal cellularity. And it's the term that we use when we have these patterns of palisading in a schwannoma, we call them varicae bodies, okay? Varicae bodies are really helpful finding for schwannoma, but I'm gonna tell you two caveats. Number one, varicae bodies or, or structures that have palisading and look just like varicae bodies can actually be seen in a lot of other soft tissue tumors. I've seen them in lyomyomas, I've seen them in dermatofibromas and other things. So not all the palisades is a schwannoma. I think William Shakespeare actually said that, not really, but but I like to say that because I think it's uh, it's an important thing to remember that just because it has palisades, schwannoma obviously is the first thing that comes to mind, but other things can palisade also, okay? The other thing is that not all schwannomas have varicae bodies. The palisading, is, when varicae bodies are present, sometimes they look classic like this, but there are plenty of times where they're very subtle, kind of kind of vague palisading, not nicely arranged varicae bodies. And it's important to recognize schwannoma, not just from the varicae bodies, but from all of the other features that I'm gonna point out in this video. Because sometimes, either on a small sample, you won't have any palisading or any varicae bodies, or it will be very subtle, um, or sometimes you have unusual variants of schwannoma that have predominantly uh, hypocellular areas or other features. And recognizing that something is schwannoma is helpful because schwannomas can have a variety of features that look pretty atypical and yet still have a benign behavior. And um, so once you recognize something's a schwannoma, you can accept for example, nuclear pleomorphism and areas of hypercellularity and other things that might worry you in other tumors. So recognizing that something's a schwannoma is important because sometimes it will avoid an overdiagnosis of sarcoma um, if, you, uh, if you otherwise didn't know it was a schwannoma. All right, so that's the, that's the varicae bodies, the palisading. And when we go to lower power, you can see it's just dramatic. It's unbelievable how many, how many varicae bodies, like tiger stripes here. This is as good as it gets, and um, it doesn't often look this good. Okay, let's go to real low power and point out a few other features. Schwannomas arise off of peripheral nerves, okay? they either off the roots of the nerves coming off of the spinal cord or in the peripheral nervous system, uh, either in small or large nerves. They arise kind of towards the periphery of the nerve and they bulge out of the nerve and they are enwrapped with, on the, on the edge, a fibrous capsule that's made of perineurium and also adjacent uh, kind of compressed fibrous tissue. And you can see a little bit of that capsule here. So most of the time when you see a schwannoma, it's gonna have a capsule around it, a thick fibrous capsule. Um, and uh, the, this is true in most schwannomas. There are some exceptions, particularly in schwannomas in the dermis. Sometimes they're not as encapsulated or in the submucosa, um, like in the esophagus or other places in the GI tract, you can sometimes have uh, not as well circumscribed or encapsulated um, tumors. But most of the time, schwannomas are encapsulated and circumscribed. So that's one important uh, point, okay? Number two, schwannomas have two different zones and they can be present in variable amounts. Zone, the, the one zone is hypercellular and that's called the Antony A area. Antony A are the areas where you're gonna find the varicae bodies. 
Antony A and Vera K, they rhyme. That's one way to remember. Also, to make Vera K bodies, you have to have cells, and the hypercellular area is the is the Antony A area. So those are the two ways you can remember that. So these these cellular zones here are going to be uh, your Antony A areas. And then as you come out to the periphery here, you can see this zone that's more pale, less cellular. That's going to probably represent your Antony B. Most of this schwannoma actually is Antony A, but there's a little bit of Antony B here. And the Antony B areas tend to be less cellular. The cells are um, kind of spaced out from one another and have intervening either myxoid or kind of edematous backgrounds and uh, collagen that's kind of spaced out by white spaces or bluish myxoid spaces, okay? So all this stuff in here would represent your Antony B component. When schwannomas are composed mostly of Antony B, I find that they can be challenging to recognize. They can look very myxoid, they can resemble neurofibromas, they can have a lot of different appearances, okay? So once you, once you look around and find an area, even a focal area like this of Antony A with palisading and varicate bodies, well then it's pretty easy to make the diagnosis of schwannoma. But when you just have the Antony B areas, it can be a lot more challenging, and the Antony B areas can strikingly resemble the, the features of neurofibroma in some cases. Here's another finding that's helpful and is often present in schwannoma, hemorrhage and hemosiderin deposition. So you can see some little siderophages right here, macrophages, that are kind of eating up the hemosiderin, and that's these brown pigmented cells here. So that's a common finding in schwannomas. They often have dilated vessels that have perivascular uh, fibrosis or sclerosis, and uh, they often have leaking of blood out of those vessels and hemorrhage and hemosiderin. So that's a useful clue to recognize. And let's go look at the vessels here. I think the vessels are a really useful clue to a diagnosis of schwannoma, especially if you don't have the other features and you don't see varicay bodies. Look at these vessels, they're dilated and they have this thick band of pink sclerotic collagen wrapping around, kind of thickening the wall of the vessel. So dilated vessels are common and they often have a sclerotic hyalinized vessel wall. That's a very common feature. Look there, look at that, like it's like a kid took a pink crayon and just drew a, a circle around the outside, outline of each vessel. And sometimes it can be really dramatic Here's another look at that. That's a, a classic example of the perivascular hyalinization, the vessel wall hyalinization you see in schwannomas. So hyper and hypocellular areas, um, varicade bodies or nuclear palisading, dilated vessels with sclerosis um, and hyalinization in the wall, and uh, a nice uh, capsule and well circumscribed periphery. Those are the features of schwannoma. If you need to, in this case, this is an H and E diagnosis here. This one's classic. But if you need to confirm it you can do an S100 or a SOX10, which will be diffusely positive and, and stain essentially all the cells that you see here except for the background inflammatory cells, which can sometimes be present in schwannoma. Here's one feature I want to point out though right here. Look at this. These areas are getting cellular and they're kind of streaming in fascicles. And if you've watched my neurofibroma video, we talk about how neurofibromas sometimes transform into malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, particularly in the setting of neurofibromatosis type one. And one of the clues to transformation is hypercellular fascicular growth. That is a feature, a feature like this is worrisome in a neurofibroma and you worry about low-grade malignant transformation. In a schwannoma, it's totally acceptable and you can have really kind of striking hypercellularity, fascicular growth, even almost a herringbone growth pattern. There's a form of schwannoma called cellular schwannoma, which I'll have to address in a different video, that can really closely mimic malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor and it's a really difficult, uh, challenging differential in soft tissue pathology. But this is why most of the time telling neurofibroma from schwannoma is not that important because they're both benign nerve sheath tumors. It becomes important when you have features like this, where if it's a schwannoma, it's acceptable, no worries. If it's a neurofibroma, then you start getting really worried in that setting. Okay, Schwann neurofibromas can have malignant transformation sometimes. It's extremely rare. Schwannomas can transform into malignancy. Um, and I don't like the term malignant schwannoma because I think that's confusing. I like the idea of a sarcoma arising out of a schwannoma as the term. But it's so extremely rare. I've seen like one or two cases ever. Whereas I see malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors in the setting of neurofibroma on a relatively regular basis, okay? So just remember that you can have these fascicular findings. Mitoses are usually infrequent in schwannomas, but I've definitely seen some that can have mitosis and um, and so that by itself does not make a diagnosis of malignancy but if you see some mitoses use some caution and look around and make sure that you're really dealing with a schwannoma. Schwannomas often in in the skin they often arise deeper down in the subcutis or the deep soft tissue but occasionally they can bulge up into the dermis. This one's mostly located in the subcutis just below the deep dermis here 
but sometimes you can see them in the dermis like this. See, it's pushed up into the dermis. And here you can see from low power, we've got a nodule that's circumscribed, kind of like an oval egg shape. It's got, this case does have a capsule. Uh, again, in the skin, they don't always, but they often still do. Here's a nice peripheral capsule. And look in the middle. If you get an area like this, you might not know what to do with that, right? There's no varicae bodies here. It's kind of cellular and kind of variable, haphazard arrangement of cells. Some of them are a little bit enlarged. But when you look around, you start seeing dilated blood vessels. That's one clue. You start seeing some sclerosis around vessel or hyalinization of vessel walls. Look right there. Hyalinization of a vessel wall. So see you're in a spindle cell tumor and you've got hyalinized vessel walls and then you do an S100 and it's strongly positive, you're starting to think of schwannoma. But you can see zones like this where it really there's no arrangement of these cells that might suggest to you a schwannoma. That's why it's important to recognize all the other features because sometimes you will not have easily identifiable varicate bodies. All right, I think this case though does begin like over here these certainly aren't like the case I just showed you, but you can see how the cells are kind of clumping up and leaving zones where there's very little cellularity. You kind of got a line or a clump of cells and then no cells, and then a clump of cells and then no cells. So this is kind of subtle, vague palisading. These are kind of varicate bodies, just not really well-formed ones. And so I think it's important to begin to recognize that vague sense of lining up or parallel arrangement of the nuclei and then spaces of, of less cellularity. And that's an important clue for schwannoma and other tumors that have palisading, learning to recognize the subtle, vague palisading. Like right here, see how these cells are kind of all lining up together. They're not making a perfect like picket fence row, but they're making kind of an arrangement and then a space where there's less next to it. And I think recognizing that vague palisading is a, is a, it takes a little bit of practice, but it's a really useful skill. And then here's, there's more palisading right here. Look, see, there's a very good body palisade space with pink collagen, another palisade. And then look, if we look over on the other piece of tissue, then you get an area like that. No problem. Those are really nice varicate bodies, right? So learning though to recognize the subtle ones is helpful. And again, look out for the dilated vessels with a hyalinized vessel wall. That's helpful, really helpful clue. Here's an example. I think this was from a nerve root uh, off of the spinal cord. And this is a small, uh, probably encapsulated tumor. It's at least circumscribed. And before we go in closer, you can see this is a nice example of how you have hypercellular Antony A zones, Antony A areas, and then hypocellular zones that are the, the kind of loose, pale Antony B areas. This schwannoma has a nice amount of dilated vessels and hemorrhage, sclerosis of vessel walls, and also there'll be deposition of fibrin when you have a lot of blood and hemorrhage in these. So sometimes the vessels can get kind of complex because you can get kind of almost like a thrombotic change in the vessel where the vessel is uh, kind of reorganizing around itself. You can see like right here, there's kind of this complexity and in infolding of the vessel. And I think that what's happening here is that the, as the vessels hyalinize and leak, the sclerotic collagen and the fibrin kind of intermingle together and it almost is like an organizing thrombosis. That's the way I kind of envision it at least or think about it. So this kind of a complex vascular change is a common feature in schwannoma. And the other reason I wanted to point out this particular case, again, there's not, not great varicate bodies. We do have a little bit of that fascicular arrangement that I talked about earlier that you can have fascicle formation. See how the cells are kind of streaming along parallel or uh, in, in uh, kind of the same, uh, like a school of fish, they're kind of streaming along. So these fascicles can be seen in schwannomas. But this case had something I wanted to show. There it is. If I can get it in focus. Random pleomorphism. This hyperchromatic pleomorphic nucleus here in the middle, and there's maybe a little bit of pleomorphism over here. Scattered pleomorphic Schwann cells are actually a common finding in schwannoma, and they're a helpful diagnostic clue. Random pleomorphism uh, is seen in a lot of different uh, nerve sheath tumors. You can see it in granular cell tumors, nerve fibromas, and others. But it's a helpful clue when you see random pleomorphism. It shouldn't worry you for malignancy, especially in a schwannoma. You can have really dramatic pleomorphism in schwannoma, and it's still totally benign. And uh, again, my neurofibroma video talks about the fact that you can see that in neurofibromas, and by itself, that is not a malignant feature. Um, when you have uh, scattered pleomorphic cells. This is kind of a degenerative um, uh, feature here that we see. 
And when it's really abundant, sometimes we call them uh, ancient schwannomas or schwannoma with ancient change. Here's a little bit of varicae bodies right over here. Varicae, varicae, varicae. So they're often there, but they're not always abundant and sometimes you have to look around. And here's another example. of scattered pleomorphic cells. You can see these big guys there, 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 there. Random atypia is a useful diagnostic clue for schwannoma. Here's a case that is dramatically hemorrhagic and bloody. You have numerous dilated vessels, lots of blood-filled spaces in those vessels, blood leaking into the tissue, hemosiderin, fibrin, and this case actually was, was a consult I saw a long time ago and was submitted um, as a, you know, concerning for a vascular neoplasm. And a lot of different vascular stains have been done, but an S100 had not been done. And so uh, one of the general rules I teach in soft tissue pathology is if you have a spindle cell tumor and you don't know what it is and you're doing an immunostain panel and you've done four or five different immunostains and have not done an S100 or a SOX10, you should probably consider doing an S100 or a SOX10. Um, I, that's like one of the first stains I do in a panel of stains when I'm working up a spindle cell tumor and I'm not sure what it is. One of the very first things I do is an S100 or a SOX10 um, because it's a good way to look at um, um, uh, neural differentiation and melanocytic differentiation. And again, there's just dramatic uh, hemorrhage and blood-filled space here, so it's not surprising that this would, would concern someone for the possibility of a vascular tumor. And again, in the background, you can see the cellular spindle cells. Very vague sense of palisading here. You can, they're not good varicae bodies, but you can see again that the nuclei are starting to kind of line up next to each other. And S100 was diffusely positive in this case. So this is just an example of the abundant hemorrhage uh, that you can have in schwannomas. And you can see, I think over here, maybe there were some better varicate bodies. Those are nice fascicles, almost a kind of herringbone arrangement. And again, a good contrast of the hypercellular Antoni A areas, starting to transition into less cellular zones as you move. So the cellularity is often variable in different parts of a uh, schwannoma. That's probably a varicate body right there, actually. It's not the best example of one, but I think that this is a varicate body here. All right. And again, a nice, thick, fibrous capsule. Look at how thick that capsule is. Here is another example of a schwannoma uh, that has abundant fibrin and hemorrhage. And here you can see there's big, a big basically fibrin thrombus that's formed in this vessel and the thrombus has begun to organize and make uh, papillary endothelial um, hyperplasia or Masson's uh, phenomenon, Masson tumor effect here in the midst of this vessel. And I'll do another video about um, uh, papillary endothelial hyperplasia, Masson tumor in the future. But yeah, you can see really dramatic uh, changes like that sometimes. And here again is an amazing example of the hyalinization of the vessel wall. Abundant hemosiderin in macrophages in the background, really helpful clue. And look at this. See, the, the atypia here is not messing around. It's big atypia sometimes, scattered really pleomorphic cells. And so it's an easy, um, it's an easy thing to make a mistake and think that this is somehow malignant. Uh, one other tumor that can look quite a lot like what I'm showing you here with this fibrin, the dilated vessels, the hyalinization, and the scattered atypia and hemosiderin is um, pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor, PHAT, fat. And I have another video about uh, PHAT, and you can go watch that and check it out and uh, see the differences. The big, the big difference to distinguish them is the, the lack of staining for S100 in fat, uh, whereas you have diffuse S100 here. And here's another zone that has, I mean, really dramatic um, scattered pleomorphism, and it's becoming kind of cellular here. I mean, it's still relatively spaced out. It's not making solid sheets of cells like you'd have in a sarcoma. And again, mitoses are usually either absent or, or pretty infrequent. If you start seeing a lot of mitoses, um, you should give thought to the possibility that maybe this is, is something else. But I, again, I have seen schwannomas with mitotic activity, even ones with atypia and mitotic activity that behaved um, okay. 
So just do keep it in mind though as an alternative possibility to make sure that all the other features fit well for Schwannoma. And that's why we teach all these different features, not just varicae bodies, because you have to be able to recognize the ones like this that have very unusual changes. So when you have abundant atypia and a lot of uh, background sclerosis, look at the zone of kind of hypocellular sclerotic collagen, and you've got abundant hemorrhage and dilated vessels, we call that an ancient schwannoma, if you like, or a schwannoma with ancient change. So this abundant sclerosis is uh, an example. When we have the abundant sclerosis, the pleomorphism, and the, uh, the vessel changes, you can say that's a, a schwannoma with ancient change, and the idea is that as these tumors have sat around for a long time, that maybe they've undergone these degenerative uh, changes. Now, I don't know for sure that it necessarily is due to the age of the tumor, but that's kind of one of the, the thoughts, at least, of how we conceptualize it. So really good example, and then here we go over here, you're starting to see maybe some palisading of nuclei, like right here, see how the nuclei are all lined up in a row? It's like, it's like half of a varicae body. But again, learning to recognize that nuclear palisading, even when it's not a classic varicae body, really important feature for schwannomas. Here's one other case of schwannoma with ancient change, and then I'll show you a couple unusual variants of schwannoma before we finish here. Here's a, a nice example of, again, the, the cellular Antony A areas the hypocellular Antony B areas, the dilated vessels. See them, the same features again and again repeated, but we repeat them so it makes them easier to memorize, hopefully. Nice perivascular hyalinization, really thickened vessel wall in this case, and you can see the ancient change, the degenerative nuclear atypia here, right? Scattered, big pleomorphic cells, but mitoses are very infrequent. And again, the atypia can be quite dramatic, but usually it's relatively hypocellular and there's a paucity of mitotic activity most of the time. So again, a schwannoma with ancient change and degenerative uh, pleomorphism. And ancient schwannomas can get to be quite large, particularly in the retroperitoneum is the time where we see this often. So they can be, you know, 10 or 12 centimeters sometimes, large retroperitoneal mass. And normally on imaging, a retroperitoneal soft tissue mass is of that size is sarcoma until proven otherwise. Um, that's the way we think of it most of the time. So it's an important differential that even on a needle, if you recognize, you know, hemosiderin and sclerosis and perivascular hyalinization and S100s positive, you can make the suggestion that this is probably just a schwannoma. And I've definitely had times where that actually, where they decided because the patient wasn't a good surgical candidate, they decided to leave the tumor um, and not excise it actually. So it was able to change patient management and patient care. Um, so it's, uh, it's again, one of those times that once you recognize a schwannoma, you can buy yourself a way out of a malignant diagnosis sometimes when there's atypia present. Here's an example. It's a little fragmented, unfortunately. I think the other piece maybe looks better. Uh, this, this will show it. This is an example of a schwannoma that has multinodularity. You can see there's kind of multiple lobules or nodules here in a sclerotic background. So this is called a plexiform schwannoma, okay? And the term is a little bit of a misnomer because unlike a plexiform neurofibroma that has that truly bag of worms appearance grossly, a plexiform schwannoma looks plexiform more microscopically than grossly. It's a multi-nodular schwannoma, but the cross section of it gives you these multiple nodules closely arranged together instead of one single nodule. And so the multinodularity resembles the multinodular uh, appearance microscopically that you see in plexiform neurofibromas. And again, go back to the neurofibroma video and I discuss why you should be really careful to always uh, make, make sure that the patient has either uh, gross plexiform architecture or has a history of NF1 before making a definitive diagnosis of plexiform neurofibroma because that's giving someone basically neurofibromatosis type 1. Schwannoma, plexiform schwannoma, does not have an association with NF type 1. And so that's really important to remember that you don't mistake these things. Uh, the biggest help microscope excuse me, microscopically, is go down and find the hypercellular areas that have nuclear palisading and Antony, I'm sorry, the varicate bodies, these Antony A areas. And you can see, again, all these zones of um, uh, cellular organization and then paucity of cells in between. Really nice example of, of varicate bodies. And sometimes varicate bodies are a little bit swirly and whirly looking. Um, 
And you know, this it reminds me, I almost forgot to say, my uh, co-fellow in Dermpath Fellowship, um, Toby Foster, he had a really great saying that I, I think visually, people talk about these as being like a flock of birds flying together or a picket fence. I don't think it really looks like a picket fence, but I love the way Toby said it. He said it's if you had a pile of leaves and you were trying to clean them up and you took a, a broom or something and you swept them back and forth into two piles, you'd have a pile here and a pile over here, and then there'd be a clean space on the floor in the middle, that that's what a barricade body's like, like a pile of leaves swept back and forth into two piles. And I think that that's, to me, that's such a beautiful visualization. And Toby was definitely one of the most brilliant pathologists I've, I've known. He's a really smart guy, and he had a great way of explaining things in a common sense fashion. And so I really learned a lot from him as having him as a co-fellow. So I always look for the little, the little leaves swept back and forth uh, to think of varicae bodies. And again, uh, remember that plexiform schwannoma does not associated with um, neurofibromatosis type one. There is a form of neurofibromatosis, or, or sometimes it's considered neurofibromatosis uh, type 3, I believe, that's also that's called more properly schwannomatosis, in which patients get multiple schwannomas in their soft tissue around their body. Um, so that, and that has different, um, different um, connotations and different implications than NF1. So you can do some additional reading on that. So that's if a patient has multiple schwannomas, you can think of schwannomatosis. And also if a patient has um, what used to be called a bilateral um, acoustic neuromas, then that's called neurofibromatosis type 2. And that's actually um, not a, a great, uh, uh, those are misnomers because it's actually, they're actually schwannomas, not neuromas, and they involve the vestibular nerve, not the acoustic nerve. So, um, but anyway, if you have uh, schwannomas bilaterally um, inside of the inner ear um, off of the, um, the vestibular nerve, then that's called neurofibromatosis type 2. And again, it's totally different and unrelated to NF type 1. Here's another weird example of a schwannoma, and you might say, how on earth is this a schwannoma? Well, this the first thing I'll point out is look at the multiple tiny little nodules here and then lots of space that's kind of edematous in between. There's dilated vessels and they're hyalinized around them. And you can see these little nodules of round cells. These cells are Schwann cells, okay? This is an epithelioid schwannoma, a really unusual rare subtype of schwannoma. And the round cells have kind of round nuclei and they usually have little central nucleoli like this. And they have, um, they're arranged into these little clusters or nodules. And individual cells have a kind of collagen, basement membrane, collagen type four wrapping around the individual cells. And you can see that on a PAS stain or on a collagen type four stain for basement membrane if you uh, want. That's a, a nice pretty a uh, picture if you want to see that what that looks like because Schwann cells lay down basement membrane, basal lamina. Okay, so this little nodularity of these round Schwann cells, and this will stain with S100 and SOX10 and be negative for melanocytic markers. So the, the problem is that these can sometimes have atypia and mitotic activity, and in those cases, this can get confused with epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor or melanoma. I think one of the most helpful things here is the small size. They're usually superficial, located in the subcutis or in the skin, and they often have this, this very strikingly multinodular kind of patterned arrangement. It's almost hard to describe, but it has a very distinct look. And I may make a, a separate video in the future about epithelioid schwannoma, because uh, I uh, co-authored a paper with Dr. Weiss and some other colleagues about this entity, so it's very interesting to me. So this is an epithelial schwannoma, just to let you know that there are variants of schwannoma that look totally different than conventional schwannomas. And the one other thing that I'll bring up, even though it's probably not really related to schwannoma, but it shares the name, is this tumor right here. And you can see right away that there's abundant dark brown melanin pigment here. And if you go in closer, the tumor cells are really strikingly atypical, and not like that uh, degenerative pleomorphism that we saw in ancient schwannoma. These are big, ugly cells with big red nucleoli. I mean, you see that plus pigment, you're gonna think melanoma, right? And in fact, if you stain this tumor, it's gonna stain with S100, SOX10, MART1, HMB45. It's gonna stain just like a melanoma, basically. But this tumor is arising in the retroperitoneum and is growing out of a, a ventral nerve root. And the patient has no history of melanoma. So although melanomas, uh, you can develop metastasis of melanoma from unknown primary, it'd be pretty weird to have it show up as a, as a, as a, a met straight to a nerve root with no history or anything else, okay? And then, uh, so this is called, uh, has been called in the past melanotic schwannoma or somomatous melanotic schwannoma. 
and it is uh, probably unrelated to true schwannoma. A, a, a significant subset of these actually behave aggressively like a sarcoma and metastasize and can even cause death. So a more recent paper by uh, Andrew Fulp's group, um, which is really nice, I'll put a link in the video description for you to do some additional reading, um, proposes that we call these malignant melanotic Schwannian tumors. And even though that name is a little longer, I think it's helpful. And uh, the rare times that I've seen these in practice and diagnose them, they're, they're extremely rare. But the times I have seen them, I want to make sure in the diagnostic line that I put in the word malignant. So if you want to call it malignant melanotic schwannoma, open parentheses, malignant melanotic Schwannian tumor, whatever you do, it's important to express to the clinician, this is not a regular schwannoma. This can behave malignantly. It should be treated as potentially malignant. And um, some of these are associated with Carney syndrome, okay? So always important to keep that in mind and remember for tests. The somomatous melanotic schwannoma associated in some cases with Carney syndrome. And you can't see the little concentric lamellations, but these are the somoma bodies. They're only present in about half of the cases. These tumors can have marked atypia, they can have mitotic activity, and again, they can behave um, pretty badly. And there's no real way to predict which ones will behave um, uh, aggressively or indolently. So you, you should ideally, the thought currently is that they should all be treated as potentially malignant uh, when clinically feasible. So just bring this up because it shares the name with schwannoma and you might think it's just a variant of schwannoma, but it's actually probably a totally separate tumor. And again, Andrew Fulp's paper discusses that the molecular findings here uh, don't fit with melanoma and don't fit with conventional schwannoma somewhere in between. So it's kind of an unusual, unique subset of tumors that is uh, that stands apart. And again, I may do a, a more in depth video on this in the future to discuss the more nuanced details. So uh, that's our video about uh, schwannomas. I hope that you find it helpful and uh, please click like below if you liked it, subscribe to my channel and add any questions, comments, or suggestions for future videos in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.